the start of the chapter. Okay, in this chapter, chapter nine, we'll talk about evaluation and evaluation of competitive market. Earlier we spoke about competitive market, what's the competitive market about it. And now we will be evaluating the competitive market. <clears throat> During this chapter, we will uh, explain how perfectly competitive market encourages the technological improvement and the growth of the size of firm. We also will explain the benefits of perfect competitive markets and ex examine the five reasons perfect competition might fail to achieve the desirable results. Furthermore, we will describe how the government try to deal with the external costs, such as pollution, explain how government try to encourage production of a good and service such as education that carry external benefit. We, we heard of laziest fear, which is the economic doctrine that holds that an economy works best with the minimum amount of government in, intervention. Best example uh, closest to this is USA. Now the plant growth and the, its effect on the market. If there is, if there are economies of scale, a firm will want to increase the size of lower, to lower the cost. We know in uh, that there is a fixed cost and there is a variable cost. And the more they produce, the, cost, the fixed cost per unit, it will go lower. So when the fixed cost per unit goes lower, that means the variable, uh, the total uh, cost per unit goes lower. So the, the economies of scale, it says that a firm wants to increase it in size to lower the cost. And if you see here that uh, if a price stays the same, the profit improved. And in the long run, all the firms increase in size, price drop, and every firm earns a normal profit. So, you know, when the product increases, the prices goes lower. So everybody earns a normal profit. And if you notice here in the plant one, they are producing at the P1, which is marginal cost and average cost. And if you add them together or there is a more company produce more so they can produce as a lower cost. So the price and a long term, uh, long run equilibrium, the average cost one to the average cost six represent the short run average cost, different size of plan. So the plan start producing hundred, it starts here and then start producing 200 and then producing 300, which is that's where the long uh, average cost and marginal cost is together. So in the long term, firm will choose the planet three to minimize the, uh, minimize the cost. So basically, the price equal with the minimum average cost, which is here, is equal with the minimum long term, long run average cost, which is equal with the marginal cost. And that's the quantities to produce at this price. <clears throat> so exactly why should a firm downsize if it is suffering from this economize of scales? A firm suffering this economize of scale is operating at a scale too large for this type of industry. 
It is therefore experiencing high average costs due to the high bureaucratic costs associated with the big corp corporation. It could produce at a lower average cost if it could reduce its size. The benefit of perfect competition. There is a few benefits. One of the benefits is called productive efficiencies. Production of an output at a, the lowest possible average, which is we saw it in the previous graph, uh, that is where the price equal the, with the minimum average cost. And then we have the allocative efficiencies, which is the allocation of resources to the goods and service that society value most. So they might be companies producing something, but the society value it less than if they produce something else. And this occurs where is the price equal with the marginal cost. So the best situation is the price equal with the minimum average cost equal with the marginal cost. And then what we have, you called you, we heard it earlier about the producer surplus. The difference between the amount that a producer would be willing to accept for each unit of output and the price they receive when the output is sold. The second definition will explain it in the next slide, the summation of consumer surplus and procedure surplus. If you look at it here, um, <clears throat> probably this is what you call, we said in earlier, this is where it is the allocative efficiencies is here, whereas marginal cost, uh, average revenue and average cost. But coming back to the consumer surplus and producer surplus, if you look here, for example, at this graph, we see that suppliers is willing to produce, for example, at this price, price of two, willing to produce 100. And at the price of uh, three, four, willing to produce 200. But actually what the suppliers is doing, and it is a, a price that in a market, which is at a, a quantity at a, at a $6, he's producing 3000 units. So this is what their equilibrium. So um, the difference amount between, you know, this triangle, what you call a, a producer's surplus. On other hand, there is what you call a consumer surplus. You know, sometimes you're willing to pay uh, for a thousand units, $10. But actually what you are doing is you are really saving when it's you paying only $6. So this triangle is what do you call um, a consumer surplus. So minimizing the cost is a productive efficiencies here, but minimizing the surplus, which is producer surplus and consumer surplus is what you call allocative efficiencies. Now in the perfect competition for strength of a competitive market, one is maximized economic of surplus and because the both productive efficiencies and allocative efficiencies are achieved, does this automatically without it cost less and encourage innovation because you wanna reduce the cost and promote the economic freedom. So giving the following graph down there, at what output is the, the firm is a productively efficient? And the second question, at what output is the firm allocatively efficient? So if we wanna look at the productively efficiencies, then we need to see where it is actually the marginal cost 
equal with the average cost. That's where the producers usually love to produce. They don't want to put, pay more on that. On the second hand, at what output the, uh, is the firm have allocatively efficient? It is at the Q2. So at the Q2, where is the marginal cost meet the price that they are offering. Now, there is market failure or chance of market failures in perfect competitive is defect in competitive market that prevent uh, an efficient or equitable allocation of resource. There is a five types, which is the causing that. You may uh, see or I mean, create an income and wealth inequalities. So the rich people get richer and the poor people get poorer. Maybe a quiet, unstable. Maybe competition that market internal regulatory may disappear and provide no public goods and ignore externalities. Now we define each one of them and we see how this might happen. In the public good, good or services who benefits are not affected by the number of the users and the form and from which no one can be excluded. Like the roads, uh, like the water, good water. In the private goods that goods or services whose benefit can be denied to non-buyers and whose consumption by one person reduce the amount available for others, like the breads, the food. But in the public good, we said like the roads, the bridges, uh, uh, public education, these are the things that now, there is what you call a quasi-public good, which is something in the middle. It's a private good that are provided by the government because they are they involve extens intensive external benefit for the general public. And what do we have? Non-rival, a feature that means that one person consumption does not reduce the amount available for others. It's like the rules once again. But you have non-excludable, which is a feature that means that it is impossible to prevent non-buyers from enjoying the benefit, like the clean airs. So public goods, are both non-rival, which is a feature that means that no one person's consumption does, does not reduce the amount available, and non-excludable, which is you cannot exclude someone from a clean air. Now, what's an externalities? The benefit or cost, both of them, experienced by people who neither produce nor consume a product. Like when you are uh, living beside a plant who, plant who produce pollutions, there is a cost on you. The external cost, costs that are incurred by people other than producers or consumers of product, and there is an external benefit, benefit that are enjoyed by people other than producers or consumers of the product, like finding an oil well runs by the government then later on. Dealing with the external costs, there is cost and how we deal with it. This is the government usually use it a lot. It is a policymaker attempt to determine the value of important externalities and integrate this into the production process, like the pollution. The three basic way of controlling it is 
legislative control, putting laws, taxation, and putting a cap and trade. The legislative control like to limit the pollution or ban the toxic substances. Um, another example, offense that can be difficult to detect and prosecute it. And there is no incentive to go beyond a minimum standard uh, for the producers. The other way of doing it is taxation through taxation, which is the marginal private cost, the external and uh, the extra internal or a private cost that producers of an increasing production by additional units. So they put more taxes, so they not can, there is more cost on them. So they have to minimize their production. The marginal uh, social cost, which is the additional cost to the both producers, internal cost, and the society external cost of producing additional quantity of a product, like uh, having an extra bottle of plastic water. This is what you call cap and trade. And this is where you attempt to minimize the cost of reaching a predefined pollution emission target a cap. And it's going on now, people are uh, talking about it between the European Union, uh, USA and Canada. Individual pollution companies are allocated or allocated shares on the total cap called credit. So they have certain percentage of pollutions and they get a credit for it. It's like a credit and debit is done this way. Other company may, in, may create a new credit by eliminating the pollution. So they're planting trees, for example. If a producer wishes to pollute more, it can trade by through, can buy unused credit from other firms or buy a credit from the that have created them. Now, integrating external benefit. There is two basic way, a provision of a quasi public good like uh, education, healthcare, transportation. What is provided varies widely across the country. Some countries, some places that they don't give enough taxes, they have access to good product uh, education, and some of them they do and also have access to education. Providing su subsidies like a daycare, this is another way uh, of uh, integrating external benefits. Subsidies, the marginal private benefit, the extra benefit that the buyer drive from consuming additional quantities of a product. So if the food is subsidized, means partially paid by the government. So there is a marginal private benefit. The marginal social benefit, the extra benefit to both the consumer and the society of additional quantity that produce like the education. So here we reach to the chapter nine. In the chapter nine, we talked about competitive market and courage technological improvement and firm growth. We spoke about the benefit of a competitive market the cause of market failures, how the government can discourage a production of goods with the external cost and encourage a production of goods with external benefit. Thank you.